Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, a new book shows that the centers of power in America are shifting to cities. What does that mean for the Phoenix metropolitan area? And we'll check on the status of the retirement system for Arizona state workers. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. The acquittal of George Zimmerman in the Florida shooting death of teenager Trayvon Martin is prompting demonstrations and rallies around the country, including here in the Valley. We talked to Arizona State University history professor Matthew Whitaker about his reaction to the jury's decision. Whitaker is the founding director for ASU Center for the Study of Race and Democracy and the father of an 11-year-old son. Whitaker says that what happened in Florida could happen here. Fear of change, fear of demographic change, fear of uh, the others, who, whomever those others are, somehow not fitting the bill for acceptable citizenship, somehow being different and not warranting the type of respect that one would give someone else. And it's that type of, of feeling, it's that type of atmosphere that creates the type of cauldron in which tragedies like this Trayvon Martin death happen. And we in Arizona cannot give ourselves pious airs as if it's not possible. It is. And I think our leaders would be remiss if they did not acknowledge that it is at least possible and start to take steps to, to make it less possible by working with schools, by sponsoring legislation that is inclusive and not divisive, by not sponsoring policies and programs that vilify and demonize others, Sp po sponsoring policies and programs that humanize people and bring people together. So I think it can happen here. I do think that this is a very conservative state, but there's lots of good people. I know that there are some folks who are uh, meeting in living rooms, meeting in, in organizations throughout the state to talk about what can we do. You know, that's one of the first stages. What can we do to educate? What can we do to uh, make sure that Trevon Martin did not die in vain? What, what avenues are available to us from the legal process, from a legal standpoint, from a political standpoint, uh, from an educational standpoint. So I think you're going to see lots of, of things happening, and that's good. Um, a lot of folks were saying, well, we hope folks don't riot. We hope they don't do this, they don't do, we, they don't do that. And there's inherent stereotype in that, right? We're just assuming. Uh, <laughs> there's historical precedent, but then there's also stereotype. What I've seen are a lot of young people in particular saying, we're not going to lie down for this. We believe um, that this is what happened, and this is what we need to do to make sure that doesn't happen here, and to make sure that there's some sort of justice for Trevon Martin and his family. Whitaker says that the Center for the Study of Race and Democracy plans to hold a Healing Racism Forum set for September 11th. The Metropolitan Revolution, How Cities and Metros Are Fixing Our Broken Politics and Fragile Economy. That's the title of a new book that examines how power is increasingly shifting from state and federal governments to cities and metro areas. The Brookings Institute took those ideas and released a Metropolitan Business Plan that adopts the discipline of the private sector to regional revitalization. Mayors in the Phoenix area have organized a high-level steering committee to guide the development of a new economic growth plan. And joining me to talk about the plan are Phoenix Mayor Greg Stanton, Barry Broom, President and CEO of the Greater Phoenix Economic Council, and Steve Sesnow, President and CEO of the Arizona Community Foundation. Good to have you all here. Thanks for Good joining Good to be here. Thanks. Mayor, we'll start with you. What is the Metropolitan Revolution? Well, I think it's really a statement that uh, our economic success here in this region is not going to emanate from Washington, D.C.'s and policies there. So hopefully they have smart policy there, but really it's going to be whether we are adopt smart public policies here to advance our economy. We're competing against not only other regions of the country, but against regions of the world. And I think people are looking for us as city leaders, as regional leaders, uh, to get the job done. You know, cities are really where people still have confidence in government. I think people, for the most part, have lost confidence in Washington, D.C., and the gridlock there. I think they have less confidence at what goes on in the state legislature. But I still think they, they, they believe that cities are functional levels of government. And if we're going to compete at an international level, we've got to get policies right uh, here at the local level. And that's what this is all about. Barry, are cities doing things right? State and federal doing things wrong? A little bit of both? What's happening out there? Well, I think, I think cities are on the ground and are connected to their constituents. I mean, the difference between being a mayor and a councilman versus being a member of Congress is you live with your constituents. 
Uh, one of the things we do, you know, we work with 21 mayors at GPAC, and one of the things we tell a newly elected mayor is, you know, you're going to be one of the very few public officials where you're going to hear from your constituents when you're in a grocery store, when you're at church. That doesn't happen so much for people in Washington, D.C. So there's a greater disconnect from D.C. to the constituency. State more so than D.C., but still very disconnected. But whether it's fixing parks, rec you know, recreational programs, youth intervention, keeping streets clean, public safety, the municipal leaders are on the ground with the constituents. And I think they're closer to them and are more apt to make uh, capable decisions that are in the interests of the community. Steve, is this a gradual change, something sudden? What's happening out there? Well, I think the shift has been occurring for some time. And I think over the last few years when we've seen a very little happening in Washington, D.C., we realize we have to take charge of our own economic destiny. We can't wait for the signals or the leadership from D.C. to tell us what we need to do economically. We, we have, as cities, uh, great experience in running services and programs for the people who live in our communities. We know how to do that. We know how to do that better than anybody in D.C. does. Uh, so now we're transferring that kind of knowledge and skill set and wisdom, say, can't we control our own economic destiny? Uh, it's not that we haven't been engaged in our economic futures, but really uh, building the infrastructure, creating the incentives, creating the kind of economic ecosystems that we need to, to really drive what we think will work here in our unique place. With that in mind, the definition of a city, is it somehow changing? Well, that's important to note is that uh, the Metropolitan Revolution is about two things. Number one, that we're going to sink or swim as a region, not w with Washington, but we have to act as a region. City of Phoenix can't be adopting self-defeating tax policies to steal jobs from another city and region. That's a waste of our time. We have to be operating as good teammates, and that's incredibly important that we, as regional city leaders, get together and be on the same team that we're chasing after the right companies, the right jobs, higher wage jobs, a higher educated workforce, and not engaging in intra-city, intra-region competition. That's not smart. It almost sounds like we're talking city-states, little pseudo-city-states developing here, these, these metropolitan regions that are getting more powerful by the day. Are we talking something along those lines? Well, two-thirds of the people in the United States live in a metropolitan region. Seventy-five percent of all the economic output in the U.S. is now in these metropolitan regions. And you live with and are connected to your, your leadership. So I, I do think it's a city-state initiative. I also think, as Mayor Stanton is saying, you know, this, this has long been a very effective region. You know, how do you gain more leverage around that regional model? Uh, I think, you know, Mayor Stanton and the other mayors understand, you know, if an employer, you know, if State Farm puts 4,000 jobs in Tempe, they're probably going to hire 1,500 people from the city of Phoenix and maybe 500 from Scottsdale and 300 from Gilbert and 250 from Chandler. So, you know, they understand that these economic benefits go beyond political jurisdictions and working as a team is going to accelerate the benefits, increase wealth, and drive higher performance. So again, is it, is it just the fact that you are on the ground with your constituents? Is that the big, because why, why isn't this happening at the state level? We can maybe understand a little bit of the distance with, with Congress, but uh, there certainly is a difference here in Arizona between what's happening state, what's happening local. Well, th there certainly, I think, as both have said, there's a, there's a clear role for the state to play to, to enable regions of the state to kind of actualize their economic futures. But I think what we're able to do at the regional level is collaborate. And if you look at the new economy and you look at uh, business today and successful companies, those companies are forming all kinds of unique alliances, uh, both within their industries and across industries and across nations. And so we have the capacity to collaborate, as we've seen with the three uh, major mayors here, Mayor Stanton, Mayor Smith, Mayor Rogers, all coming together, not competing with each other, but collaborating and, and forming alliances because uh, we'll, we'll have all boats rise that way and really selling the region for economic development as opposed to one town or one city. Well, we're trying to build a modern economy that works for everyone, up and down the socioeconomic uh, scale. But we're in hyper-competition, hyper-competition for talent. And that means us as a region, City of Phoenix and all the other cities, need to be at the top of our game, providing the very best quality of life. You've got to be committed to supporting the arts. You've got to be committed to supporting historic preservation, protecting great neighborhoods. You want to be a place that the top entrepreneurs, the people that we're competing for against other cities across the country and the world, you want to be a place that they want to come to. 
Uh, and so investment in the right things makes a big, big difference if we're going to win this competition. Does that make a big, you, you deal with these people that are looking to transfer out here and, and expand out here. Does that make a difference? Makes a big difference. I mean, and I think, I think you know, part of a good business environment is how people cooperate. But the best companies and the most sophisticated companies, you know, they're asking things like, what's your sponsored research for technology? You know, let's uh, spend a lot of time evaluating what your real educational picture is. And of course, um, as the mayor is saying, a lot of the most creative professional classes, you know, they have a humanities infrastructure in their body of work, and the arts is very important to these companies and to these industries. With that in mind, the Metropolitan Business Plan, what are we talking about here and how does that impact the Phoenix metro area? Well, we're really talking about uh, putting together a very clear strategy that builds off the assets of this region, that looks at what uh, is, a, is here right now in the Phoenix metro area that can be expanded, that can be accelerated. Uh, you know, we have some amazing industries and we, we lead, lead the world in a lot of different areas. For example, online learning. Uh, we are probably the uh, most important city in the world around online learning. If you look at not only the large companies like Apollo and University of Phoenix, but all up and down the Tempe to Scottsdale corridor, uh, there are enormous and growing numbers of education software companies. We lead the nation in that. How do we build that out? How do we create an infrastructure there? So I think we need to, to kind of capture what the assets are in this region what's the infrastructure to support it, what are the incentives su to support it, and to craft out a strategy for business, for philanthropy, and for government in, in terms of how do we build the new Arizona economy. We are just digging out from the worst recession since the, the Great Depression, uh, and Phoenix got hammered this economy almost as hard as any other city in the country because of over-reliance on real estate. We've asked Steve to chair our metropolitan business planning process to make sure that we have the attitude of never again. We have to build a more diverse, sustainable, high-wage economy with a higher educated uh, workforce that can better withstand the, the ups and the downs. We can't have this roller coaster that we've had. We've got to really look in the mirror and say, how can we up our game? It's what we owe the next generation. So this planning process that we're going through right now is going to pay dividends for decades down the line. The planning process and upping your game as opposed to demand and what is really needed out there and maybe projected demand. I mean, how do you work that balancing act? Well, a lot of this is, starts with great data and great evidence. So one of the things I think that's plagued uh, the Valley and Arizona is, you know, we've operated too much on anecdotal information and evidence. So we've tend to follow trends instead of set and lead trends. As Steve is saying, you know, we're, we are, without question, the digital center of excellence for educational IT. So now we have uh, uh, evidence to that effect. Now that's a sector in which we can lead. What are the intentional behaviors of the marketplace to take that sector to the promised land so that we lead uh, globally in that very important space. So it's going to start with great information and data, and then there's going to have to be an intentional plan in which we execute against that. And that plan is going to have to include everybody. You know, we're going to have to have a very broad-based coalition of people to work and develop on that plan. People like GPL, you know, the Arizona Chamber, Greater Phoenix Chamber. You know, we're going to need our partners, MAG, you know, the, the Metropolitan Planning Organization, to work with us, both university presidents, uh, Dr. Hart and Dr. Crow are at the table for this. So it's got to be a very serious coalition. It's got to operate on evidence. We have to have very high standards. And it's time for us to make a big move because one of the things in the data, we are recovering more dependent on housing than we were prior to 2007. Mm -hmm. Our recovery is more housing dependent than it was in 2007. So of the six jobs, we of every of the 10 jobs, we lost in 2007. Six were related to these construction fields. Our recovery of the 10 jobs that are recovering, seven are related to these same construction fields. So we have a major need to diversify and change our economic future. And with that in right. mind, talk about what we see here in the Phoenix area, planning, goals, unique assets, these strategizing, compared to what they're saying in, in San Diego, what they're saying in Denver, what they're saying on the East Coast. Well, I, we don't need to do what they've done in New York or in San Diego or in, in Denver or any other city. We need, to, we need to be strategic, and they were. We need to build a plan around data 
but we need to build it around the unique assets that are here in Arizona. I mean, we're in a really unique spot. We have many, many assets, whether it's an international border, whether it's great health and technology companies, whether it's great online learning companies, whether it's, it's, it's great universities, and say, what is it that we need in this region that will work for the Phoenix metro area, that will work for Arizona? It may not be the same as the other cities, but it'll be predicated on a set of, of ideas driven by data, uh, driven by existing assets, and new assets we need to bring to the table here. Last question, Mayor. Sure. Can this last, can this proceed, can this develop uh, without partisan gridlock, which we see at certain levels, without the state coming in and saying, no, 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 uh, we have control here. I mean, when things start going well, all of a sudden you've got a lot of friends. Well, we want it to go well and we want more friends. <laughs> they call it the Metropolitan Revolution for a reasons. We operate at the local level naturally in a, in a less partisan environment. We as local leaders get judged whether, by whether we get things done, not whether we crush the other side, whether we win the debate of the day, whether we deliver for the people of our city. That's what we do in the city business. And so I'm confident that this plan, uh, just like when Pittsburgh leaders got together after the fall of the steel industry, they put together an Allegheny plan that stood the test of time. And now Pittsburgh, is their economy is much more based on a higher educated workforce mm -hmm. and higher education. Similarly, I see the same thing happening here. The business community, the nonprofit community coming together with the political uh, community, put together a plan that's going to stand the test of time. I'm an optimist. I think we're heading in the right direction. Gentlemen, we'll stop it right there. Good to have you all here. Thanks for Thank joining you. us. We appreciate Thank it. You. from you. Submit your questions, comments, and concerns via email at ArizonaHorizon at ASU.edu. The Arizona State Retirement System is a $28 billion pension fund with over half a million members. The trust fund posted a 12% gain in investment last fiscal year, but the system is still catching up to cover investment losses during the recent recession. Joining us now is Paul Matson, Chief Executive of the Arizona State Retirement System. It's good to have you here. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you. Well, let's get some let's defining of what is the Arizona State Retirement System. Define the terms here. Excellent, excellent. The Arizona State Retirement System really is the largest pool of assets in the state of Arizona. It's uh, approximately $30 billion of assets. We have approximately 535,000 members, of which approximately 115,000 are retirees. So we look after the money for state employees, teachers, municipal employees, and county employees, with the exception of Fe City of Phoenix, uh, City of Tucson, and Police and Fire. Okay. Is the state pension plan underfunded as we speak? Yes, yes. Most uh, pension plans across the United States are underfunded. The uh, funded ratio at the last measurement period was approximately 74, 75 percent. And then the contributions, that's why you see actually contribution rates have risen over the last, since uh, goodness, 2003. And the reason you've seen them rise is predominantly to pay down the deficit. And indeed, when you say that the contributions have increased, that means more workers are paying a little bit more into the system. Yes. Um, no cost of living raises again this year? Correct. Because of that, still trying to catch up. Yeah, the uh, cost of living, technically with the Arizona State Retirement System, it's not a cost of living per se. Mm -hmm. It's an excess earnings payment. So when the, the uh, portfolio that is managed by the Arizona, Arizona State Retirement System has excess earnings, a percentage of that goes out to retirees, irrespective of whether or not they're not is uh, inflation. So there has not been such excess earnings for since 2006, and there's such no excess payments. And this is different uh, than what we get the PD and fire and corrections and elected officials, correct? They are yes. getting the payments, but they're not quite as healthy as 
your system? Yeah, they have a different funded status and a different payment mechanism. Uh, so you, you, if you look across the, uh, the United States, you have different port, uh, uh, pension plan structures. And some pension plans actually pay no excess payments to retirees. Some pay a fixed amount based on inflation. In Arizona, you really have two models. Some pay a fixed amount paid on excess earnings. Some pay a fixed amount based on a long-term series of potential excess earnings. We look at a 10-year uh, horizon and we'll only pay if our excess earnings over a 10-year period are beyond what our, uh, our uh, targets were. And indeed, recent stock market gains, good news for the last couple of fiscal years, correct? Yeah, absolutely. Our long-term rate of return is approximately 9.8%, and that starts from 1975. So we collect data from 1975 going forward, just under 10%, about 9.8% rate of return. The short-term rate of return for one year will be about 11.9% for two years or three years, about 11 or 12. It's the short, medium-term period between five and seven that we're hovering around six, seven, seven and a half percent rate of return. And that's what time will have to push up before there is an excess uh, payment. And you're hovering there because of what, as much as an 18 percent loss in 08, 09? Yes, correct. Then that basically just, the numbers just go crashing when the yes. market goes crashing. Really, there was a number of things that happened in the, uh, the late 90s and the early 2000s. Number one, the benefit design was enhanced. So the benefit structure in the late 90s was enhanced, so more payments went out to uh, retirees. In other words, the benefit structure was increased. Almost at the same time as you went into a period that you had two negative stock return periods, or two bear markets in the 2010s. We'll call it A1.com, O1.com, and then 2008, predominantly real estate and financial institutions. You had those two negative bull markets, on, or bear markets with equities at the same time, benefits had been increased. And that's why you saw a drop in the funded status and an increase in contribution rates. And what we're seeing now is trying to recover and get back to, what, the 20-year uh, level or something along those lines. Yeah. Really, our strategy is to increase contribution rates and then get the, con the funded status back towards 100%. Are you seeing that as far as projections? Yeah. We'll be at uh, approximately, we estimate to be approximately 80% funded in approximately uh, eight years and then a, a slow increment thereafter. You don't want to increase or decrease a funded status from say 100% very quickly because then contribution rates yes. move too, yes. too high and too low. So we smooth things through time to get us fairly slowly towards the 100%. There is a plan, I think it's in the Senate, the U.S. Senate, the idea of private insurance companies paying benefits through annuities and contracts and these sorts of things. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's interesting. This is such an important issue in the United States, uh, nationwide and with the state of Arizona. The, the, uh, the proposal you've seen in the Senate now is really funding a defined benefit plan in a manner that you would fund a annuity and that loses most of the benefits of a defined benefit plan. If you look at the portfolio that backs up a traditional defined benefit plan, it's, it's constituted with a series of investments including U.S. stocks, international stocks, access to emerging market equities. The result is you have a very significant rate of return and that lowers the cost of the retirement benefit. If you no longer fund them through that diversified investment pool, but simply through annuities, mm -hmm. which are essentially invested in fixed income securities, you lose the higher expected rate of return and your cost for the pension benefit go up. So what you want to do is create a system with the highest output expectation at the lowest cost. And I, I think that a defined benefit plan does that better than uh, uh, what you've just described. The annuities, though, I, I, for those who support this particular plan, they say that it, it would be impossible to underfund such a pension plan, which is such a concern, uh, the underfunding of these plans. Respond to that, please. Yeah, yeah I think the, uh, it is generally accurate. It would be virtually impossible to underfund such a plan, but the, the, the cost of that is to significantly increase the cost of that plan. So if, this was a, if a pension plan was a business, our goal would not be to minimize the volatility in our income and make no income. Right. It would be to accept reasonable volatility in our, in our income so that we can have greater income. And if you operate a pension plan in the same way, you accept interperiod volatility so you can maximize the pension payments to retirees at the lowest cost to the taxpayer. With that in mind, I know a lot of people just want a yes or no answer on this. 
Is the retirement system sustainable? Absolutely, yes. And the Arizona State Retirement System Health Insurance System as well. All right. It's good to have you here. Thanks oh, for joining thank you. us. My pleasure. My pleasure. Tomorrow on Arizona Horizon, a local commercial airline expert tells us what's next now that U.S. Airways shareholders have approved a merger with American Airlines, and we'll look at the status of Arizona's tourism sector. That's Tuesday evening, 5.30 and 10 on Arizona Horizon. That is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.